Okay, well, welcome everybody. And it's great to see such a good turnout, even if I can't really see you, I imagine you there. Um, so my name is Anna Williams. I work for the North Wales Wildlife Trust and I'm education and community officer in the Northwest. And I'm going to talk for the first half of the presentation, hopefully about half an hour. And then I have hand over to my colleague, Yuan, who Yuan is based over in the Northeast and he will be talking about maintenance and I'll be talking about what and how to plant. So I don't know how much you know about the Wildlife Trust, but we are a membership organization and a charity. And if you do want to join us as a member, you're very welcome. You can also join us by uh, coming on our events once they happen uh, and also looking after our reserves as a volunteer. And even if you want to come as a volunteer on a one-off, that's fine. There's no commitments at all. So on the website, you'll find out more about the volunteer events, uh, other talks, and normally guided walks and so on. And here you got mine and you as email addresses, should you want to contact us afterwards. So yeah, check out the work of the Wildlife Trust on our website. We do a lot more uh, we're growing all the time actually, excitingly, and we do marine work and youth work and different types of work. But Ewan's and my work, it's about engaging people and we do that both at our nature reserves, we take groups out. So again, if you want a guided walk at some point to your local reserve, do uh, ask us. And then also, primarily Ewan and I over the last 10, 15 years, we've been going out helping schools, community groups or workplaces create wildlife friendly gardens and habitats. We also do a lot of work for private wildlife gardening uh, and have a random competition with this. We have a advice on our website. There's a whole wildlife gardening section. So information of plants to, that are good for wildlife, how to make a pond and also, there will be a tree section, which is being translated as I'm talking. Okay, so today we're going to talk about the trees, hedges and orchards. And I'm sure you know that they're all very important for wildlife. And the best hedges is like the one in the photo here. They are thick and they're broad at the base, a mix of different species. And you can see this particular hedge uh, is at my house, I know well what's in it. It's a black thorn which is flowering early and the flowers come out before the leaves. And there is hawthorn, elder, a few oaks. And um, inside, of course, when you have an old hedge, you have a lot of space for wildlife to move along it and inside it. So, um, a variety of species and broad hedges, excellent for wildlife. And when we give advice on wildlife friendly gardening, the first thing you would ask people to do is to create a shelter. Okay, so can you all, yeah. I suddenly got some confusing messages. Anyway, so shelter in the form of a hedge. And of course we want food for the wildlife, water, and we want different habitats in our wildlife friendly gardens. So the hedges, they provide shelter from the winds, which are very, very strong here in North Wales. And, but not only that, they obviously provide shelter from predators, and they provide excellent sites for nesting for birds. And all these three hedges that you can see on the photos had birds nesting in them. The bottom left photo is from a school in Weinwald and it was great when I came in there during the wildlife garden competition actually and they, children were showing me where the birds were nesting. So a hedge is a great first step towards your wildlife haven in your gardens. 
So how do we go about planting our hedges? I'm going to talk about each of these uh, options, starting with the bare root plants. You can buy them as what's known as whips, bare root whips, and they are field grown. And as we buy them, they come, they're about two years old. They will have been lifted during the dormant season. And if you put an order in, they'll be lifted and hopefully with you within a two, three days from coming out of the soil. You then should plant them as soon as possible. If you haven't got time to plant them straight away, what you need to do is to heal them in, which is uh, putting them into the soil temporarily, just by digging a big hole and chucking them in and making sure that all the roots are well covered. So bare root planting is by far the cheapest option. Uh, root balls, they have been field grown at the nurseries for a few years. They're lifted, so they are bigger. And of course, maybe for you in a private garden, you might prefer this because it's quicker to create your hedge. Um, so it can be an excellent choice, a bit more expensive than bare root, and not everybody sell these bare root, um, root ball plants, but it's worth looking out for. Pot plants, uh, as it says, they are in a pot and therefore they can be planted any time of year. But I would recommend all the same that you plant them during the dormant season because once spring and summer come, you would be watering them forever. The plants can be a lot bigger, and again, that can cause more stress once they've been planted. So generally with tree planting, it's actually a good thing to plant a small plant. Uh, quickly enough, they will grow big. Many people are impatient and they want to plant big trees. And yes, they can survive, but they are much more likely to be stressed by the environmental conditions. Obviously, they are a lot more expensive. So if you have any stretch of hedge to plant, go for bare root or root ball plants. Yeah, so what type of plants would you like to see in your hedge? There's a wide variety of native plants and I think a mixed hedge is excellent. Uh, not everybody wants blackthorn because it can be a little bit of a nuisance. It's suckers and they will start growing plants outside of your hedge. Hawthorn is fantastic though, and hazel I'm very fond of too. You can include some small fruit trees, well, crabapple cherries, and they will be good food for uh, birds. Elder, elder, again, just have the odd one. I wouldn't, we got an inquiry, I wouldn't plant a whole hedge just with elder, but the odd elder tree in amongst your other species is a good idea. Field maple is a classic hedge plant. Spindle, we don't see that so often. Gelder rose and alder buckthorn. Alder buckthorn is a food plant for the lovely brimstone butterfly. So a few more here, there's plenty to choose from. The wild service tree used to be planted in the past regularly, but now it's a, become a rare tree in our countryside. So it'd be nice actually to include some of the more unusual ones, like the wild service or the wayfaring tree. Throw in some dog rose, some honeysuckle that can climb through the hedge and have their lovely flowers and scent, and they will attract insects, which will then be food for bats and birds. If you have a very wet site, you can put in some willow or alder, and also you can stick oaks in amongst your hedge and traditionally a few oaks would be left to grow up as large trees standards and they are sometimes hollowed and that makes a very interesting and varied hedge. So if, when, if you have a garden of course you can plant other non-natives and I think uh, here on the picture you can see these first four Burberries top left, lots of, uh, lots of berries for the birds, as well as the paracantha, which is bottom left. Escalonia have plenty of beautiful pink flowers, and so does fuchsia on the bottom right. 
Fuchsia is very common in the seaside areas, so you find a lot on the west coast of Ireland or Cornwall, as they can withstand the salt-laden winds. You can also do lower hedges, lavender hedge, are really pretty and obviously smells fantastic. And dogwood is another good species for hedging. Uh, evergreens, so yew, holly and box. Box can be tricky, but many gardeners use it a lot. I have no experience of it. Um, and then griselinia is a non-native. And then, of course, you might want to have a beach hedge where you see the brown leaves right through the year. So when I mentioned already, plant these deciduous hedges in the autumn, winter, our dormant season. Don't plant, oh, this is kind of obvious, if the soil is frozen or waterlogged. So you have to try and pick your weeks and the evergreen plants, they are best planted before Christmas, really. That just gives more time for the roots to establish before the spring and summer comes. Very important to prepare your site well. Sometimes people have a funny attitude about trees and hedges, and I think you can just throw them in in thick area of weeds and hope for the best. But very often, again, you see failures, if that's the case. Whereas if you spend a little time weeding, and then as in this picture, when I'm planting in schools, I do use a weed membrane, and I would like to find a biodegradable ones, but that's still to come. Here we are slip planting, and we put the membrane out, and we use a string to get a straight line. We plant, we give a little bit of space between the fence and your hedge. So that, as you could see in my previous photos, they bush out a lot. And then also you don't want too much to grow into your neighbours in case they are not as keen as you are. So give the hedge some space and from your fence. And then also with the small plants, you could mark out your rows about a foot apart. And then you put your plants in about a foot apart as well in a staggered fashion. And if you have bigger plants, you can do your plants, your rows further apart and your plants further apart. So it all depends on the size of hedge that you finally want and also how much space you got. But if you've got plenty of space, I would plant them further apart and they will soon fill up. So here is the same hedge a few years later. Now it's now it's too tall to reach, actually. This is in a school in Carnarvon, uh, and it's a good two metres tall. We were there pruning it back this winter. You, if you haven't got space, you can, of course, plant them in a single rows. Uh, these whips, put them again about a foot apart, three trees per metre, and make sure that you do that site preparation. This is us called my Sinclair in Carnarvon. And we planted a single row and you can see the children filling in. We made uh, slits with a spade and then the children are filling in soil around it to make sure that the roots are well covered in soil. Here is the finished product and this hedge has been very well maintained over the years and now uh, it's created that shelter they wanted for the wildlife garden so that Birds can go there and it looks a little greener all together. We've got some apple trees just inside it. So once you've got your trees in, you need to protect them from the weeds, well that's the mulch of the membrane, from the rabbits, the guards if you, if you do have rabbits, and then also actually most importantly from brush cutters or strimmers. So make sure that you delineate it. And again, I do see that many, many trees in schools get damaged from brush cutters, which is a great shame. Oh, here I'm going to just show you a little film.
Right, so that was Oscar Rula sing winner, and I hope you enjoyed watching this little girl, Maddie. She was amazing. She's only six years old and she was absolutely determined to do that wheelbarrow all by herself, as I say. So in a day, we planted 30 meters of hedge along this rather ugly fence. Many schools have those ugly fences. And this particular school is also very exposed. So hopefully the hedge will create the shelter they need from the winds and also soak up a little bit of the wet dampness in that particular corner. So we used willow and alder. And I say we, I was helped with Ridge and Roberts from the National Park and we had a great day planting this hedge. So hedges don't only need to be around the boundaries of gardens, but of course you can use them within your garden to create different rooms, as you can see in this picture. This was a very wildlife friendly garden in Rowan. The garden was absolutely teeming with birds and other insects and wildlife. Uh, and you can see why there's a lot of shelter. So slightly different wildlife friendly boundaries. Here on the top uh, right picture, I'm planting a willow fence. And basically we ran out of money and I still won't know it and we wanted a hedge. So I had made a willow dome for them and we had some leftover whips. So we plant them in a nice pattern. And then now we get a hedge that um, I can just treat as a hedge and we clip it with hedge clippers and it's doing rather well. And I was a little bit skeptical because it was rather stony ground, but willow is amazing and it's taken and it was a very good and cheap low hedge for the school. That's a fantastic wall if you're into building stone walls with the herbs and the flowers in the background. Yeah, carrying on with stone walls. Of course, living in North Wales, we have got a lot of stone walls. So if you're lucky to have one, why don't you stick some plants on top of it? And this is a great habitat for all those different animals, as I mentioned there. Hedges are important in the landscape for bats because bats, they use them to navigate along and also to feed along. And of course, if you include these night scented plants, like I mentioned, honeysuckle, that provides food for the insects, lots of lovely little midges, uh, mosquitoes and other insects, which is the food for the bats. I'm going to show you just one fantastic evening I had this summer when a bat came feeding along our top hedge and here it is flying and it came close to us. My daughter and I were standing here watching it. For those of you with good hearing and good audio, you can maybe hear it clicking there. I was absolutely amazed how close it came. Fantastic encounter. Uh, and there you could really see the importance of a, a line in the landscape. So I encourage you all, get planting. We have lost huge mileage of hedges due to intensive farming since the Second World War. And I was just looking at the landscape driving in here today and it is so sad to see big fields which would have been divided with hedging, uh, which would of course have provided all these habitats I talked about, food for bees, birds and hedgehogs. So uh, a number of environmental grants now are encouraging people to plant more hedges and we can all do our own bit in our gardens or the land that you own. So yes, get planting trees. I've mentioned a few of these already. And of course, the, what tree you choose for your garden depends on the size of your garden. Um, if you have a reasonable amount of land or even the bottom left-hand photo there is the top of a field <clears throat> by my house. And when the children were small, we collected acorns from a local woodland 
and now the kids are about 20. So that those trees have actually closed canopy and I'm amazed that we already have our own little oak woodland. So that's something for all of you to do. Uh, it's very important to get more trees growing for climate change. And I think it's very important to try and do it in sympathy with nature and what would grow there anyway. So yeah, think about what you plant. Um, fruit trees are obvious, we're going to talk about them later. And I just want to mention that bottom right hand photo, that's a wild cherry, which was given as uh, Gwyneth gave a tree as a birth present to all children born during a certain number of years. Again, a nice idea that a local council can do. That tree is 20 years old, which was the same as my son. Right, so I mentioned a few trees which are good for food. Gelder rose, top left, fantastic autumn colours and lovely red berries. Crab apple, of course, top right. Rowan tree, that's one of my favourite trees and the birds absolutely love them. And they provide a lot of um, company for you in the garden. So stick them close to your veg plot and you have the blackbirds singing for you all day long. And then elder, which is a great one, not just for the birds, but also for us. So use the produce, share it with the animals. And here is some of my favorites, elderflower cordial and also crab apple jelly. Hedgerows used to be an area where people went foraging for all kinds of berries and uh, fruit, of course, blackberries as well. And many people would make uh, tonic from elderberries. Normally, I, I just use the flowers, but if maybe some of you do that, let me know. Moving on to fruit trees. So in Penigroyce in the autumn, I managed to go out actually, and we planted an orchard um, using, with social distancing there. The children, I told them what to do and the children got on with it. And you have to choose variety according a little bit to your condition. And some, some trees are obviously hardier than others. So chat with the people where you're buying your trees. And Frank P. Matthews is a very good tree nursery. So I bought a lot of my apple trees from them. They've got a lot of choice. Do a little bit of research. And these are some of the trees I've been using in schools all very reliable uh, fruiters. You can, yeah, so you can have a look at this. We, as it's recorded, you can have a better look at this afterwards if you want to jot a few names down. Of course, we got our own very special Welsh varieties that Ian Sturrock and Sands are propagating. Um, they're based here in Bangor. And there's a lot of interest in these trees and I would recommend you include a few of those. The Bardsey apple, which is reputedly one of the world's rarest apples. Uh, Ian found it and growing in the monastery in 1999 on Bardsey and he has uh, grafted it on and is now selling that. Uh, interestingly, I thought having come from Bardsey, it would be very tolerant of wind, but it's not because it grew actually inside the wall of the monastery. But again, it's an interesting apple and have a, have a look on his website for a lot of information on local Welsh apple trees. So I'll just show you a few examples of orchards that are planted in schools. I've run a few orchard projects, as has Yuan. Yuan over in the northeast is usually lucky to be sponsored by bigger businesses like Airbus and uh, oh, he can tell you all about it. Uh, and this particular project here I'm doing with us called Gwain Gunvi and a few other schools, that was part of a pollination project. Because of course planting apple trees is great for pollinators. So here we have bare root stock. We, this is the same project, different school. It's nice to get everybody out. Headmaster was joining in and planting trees, um, or any gardening for that matter, it's a really good activity for breaking barriers, I find. 
the kids get chatting to you, the staff can talk to children in a different way to maybe normally what normally happens in a classroom. So it's a great time and actually in that particular school everybody ended up very muddy at the end of the day. But the trees got planted. So when we plant you could add a bit of bone meal, you could add a bit of compost, a dollop of well-rotted manure, but if your soil is very good, I don't think you need to add anything. It all depends on your soil. And a lot of places where I work, we have got quite poor soil, so we do tend to add something. Here, we also, in one school, we added a few snowdrops. It's a good thing to do at the same time. And you can see it's all about teamwork. Somebody holding the tree, somebody else adding the soil and the compost. I've mentioned it before, and it's really important to do this, protect your trees. So here we're actually making boxes to go around the apple trees. And that is to stop the grass cutting staff from demolishing the young apple trees. So the girls are making a wooden box. We put that around it and we put some mulch to stop the grass growing. And then the boys putting on a rabbit guard just to give it a good start in life. Some sites I put stakes in, some I don't. It depends on how exposed it is. Uh, if you're staking, you need to do it well, and you and will talk about that, because actually a badly staked tree is worse than a tree that hasn't been staked. So here you can see we planted them around four or five meters apart. That's down in Garandol Benman. And this is down at the bottom of the clean, so we've been everywhere. Uh, here is great to see. I hope those trees have grown, but I think this is actually one of my more exposed and difficult sites down in Aberdaron. Just to show you the pleasure of having your own fruit at school, making apple juice and then cooking healthy food like these stuffed apples. Needless to say, the juice from your own pressed, freshly pressed apples is way nicer than anything you can buy. The children were very excited about it. And it's a very communal thing to do. We have one of these apple press that any school could borrow if you're nearby. Um, so yeah, contact us once come to apple season. Also, we take the work outside of our schools. So here is a care home in Clumberries where um, a local asked me if we could plant some apple trees. So I got the secondary school involved, Pascal Brinner Aval, and some of the lads came out and we had a day planting a little orchard there, about nine, ten trees. And as you can see, they're very well protected because the sheep roam free in Clamberis. And here at the bottom, I hope, this is a few years ago now, so I hope they're producing lovely fruit for the crumbles and flowers for the bees in springtime. I think we should plant many more fruit trees on public land, like here along a cycle track. Uh, and then anybody who walks past can just help themselves to fresh fruit. Why not? Parks as well, I think. Uh, parks in the council land. It'd be great to have much more fruit producing uh, bushes and trees. So this is just outside Villain Helly and a bike track there. Okay and to finish off I just want to mention log piles because of course as it's important in your wildlife garden to have the whole cycle of life and decay and these logs if you got if you have been cutting some of your old trees don't take them all away as firewood leave a few to rot and be habitat for fungi mosses liverworts and then of course lots of beetles and other invertebrates that will live under the logs. Now, I haven't mentioned hedgehogs once but uh, of course these hedges are great for hedgehogs and also uh, log piles are brilliant for them to hibernate in over winter. So 
I'm just showing this lovely pruning ladder that a gentleman had made, became one of our courses. And I'm going to stop here and you and is going to carry on talking about maintenance. Thank you. Bye.